Uh, may I have your attention, please? Uh, welcome to our talk today. This is our third talk in the our forum, International Leadership Competency Forum. We have decided to organize this forum about like nine months from before now. And then we were talking that here at RISE and in Houston, we have very valuable and distinguished le leaders that we can learn a lot of things from them. And in that aspect, we talked to several distinguished leaders in their own area and then we invited them to talk in our forum. As a first speaker, we had Ambassador Edward Jerijian here two months before now. before now. And then he had a very wonderful speech on leadership on governmental organization and guide us to become one in that aspect. And as a second speaker, we had Pinkson, Rice representative, and she, 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 she had a wonderful speech too, and we, we, we were very, very glad to attend those speeches. And today, we have another wonderful speaker. He will talk about leadership and entrepreneurship in a multi multicultural world. To introduce our speaker, I, I invite Ram to here. Thanks, Kadeem. Uh, I'm very uh, deeply honored to introduce our uh, speaker, Mr. Pradeep Anand. You know, first of all, thank you for accepting my invitation to come to RISE. And uh, I actually met uh, Pradeep a couple of months ago at the uh, IIT AG, which is the Indian Institute of Technology of Alumni Association of Greater Houston. And I had a lot of uh, opportunity to talk to him on several occasions since then. You know, so when I first learned that, you know, I had to deliver the speaker introduction about such an inspiring person, so I just decided to grab the opportunity myself. And uh, Mr. Anand is originally from India. He uh, graduated from the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, with a degree in metallurgical engineering. He then came to the United States and received his MBA from the University of Houston. Currently, Mr. Anand is uh, president of Sita Resources, a management consulting firm focused on accelerating growth of its client firms, ranging from fortune finite companies to small businesses. Before that, he was vice president marketing at Landmark Graphics, a Houston-based oil and gas software company. And prior to that, he held operations and marketing management positions at Baker Hughes. Mr. Anand serves on the advisory board of the Houston Technology Center and on boards of Fordman Education Foundation, Pratham USA, and the IIT Bombay Heritage Fund. Among his many honors and awards, he received a Distinguished Service Award from the IIT Bombay back in 2001. Mr. Anand has more than 20 years of marketing experience in the technology, engineering, and oil and gas industries, and has published extensively in leading industry journals. He recently published his new novel called An Indian in a Cowboy Country. It's a collection of personal stories about an Asian Indian immigrant flourishing in America, discovering his personal and professional potential in the heart of Texas. So he is here today to tell us about uh, leadership and entrepreneurship in a multicultural world. So I think without any further ado, it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce Mr. Pradeep Anand. Thank you, Ram. You know, sometimes uh, when you hear these introductions, I, I feel as if I'm at my, uh, I'm lis listening to a eulogy at my, <laughs> at my own funeral. But let me assure you, I feel very alive and rejuvenated, especially since I see so many familiar faces and friends in the audience. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. I consider it a great honor that you've taken time to be here today. I really appreciate it. And as they say in commercials on public radio, this program would not have been possible without the generous efforts of... Uh, ILCF, International Leadership Competency Forum, and the James A. Baker III Institute for Public Policy, and other organizations at Rice University. I thank the leadership and members for extending me this privilege. And it's especially humbling to follow in these huge footsteps and footprints of Ambassador Jeregian and Ms. Ping Siun. I was here to listen to their talks too, to see <laughs> the kind of uh, people I'll be following uh, in, this, uh, in this series. Ambassador Jeregian spoke about leadership and diplomacy, and he had some phenomenal examples 
of uh, leadership, especially during the Reagan administration, and what is required uh, for peace to prevail in the Middle East. And uh, Ms. Soon enlightened us on our own personal insights, uh, especially about leadership in nonprofits. Today, it's my turn to step up to the podium, which when you're sitting over there looks like a guillotine, you know, till you get up here. <laughs> and to share my perspectives on uh, leadership and business entrepreneurship in a multicultural world. Uh, when the young members of ILCF, Ram and Vinod Kumar, I hope is watching on, uh, on the webcast, approached me to talk about leadership competency, I, I was quite pleased to learn that they believed that leadership was a competency that could be learned. And uh, so I did not hesitate, but it did puzzle me that they had picked me to talk about it. I hesitated and went into a reflective mode and then realized that I had actually participated and continue to participate in successful entrepreneurial ventures. I've done this almost all my life. I was especially fortunate that I knew and could observe many leaders in many different entrepreneurial environments across many cultures. People who study entrepreneurship typically quote and talk about a, an Austrian economist, Peter Schumpeter, Thomas Schumpeter, who said that entrepreneurship is creative destruction. That term, that term is very commonly used when you see, uh, when, you, when you listen to entrepreneurs talking on CNN or CNBC, they always talk about this whole concept called creative destruction across markets and industries, simultaneously creating new products and new business models in the marketplace. And in my opinion, there are two kinds of creative destruction that takes place. And entrepreneurial leaders are in new businesses that create destruction from the outside. And the second performs creative destruction from within organizations by leading our entrepreneurship in existing environments, existing businesses. I have been very lucky that I participated in both. I started my career in creative destruction in the upstream oil and gas industry in the, at NL Industries, where I was, first, I was the first marketing manager for its measurement or logging while drilling at Sperry Sun. I, I had and I still have the greatest admiration for Bob Brooker, our leader, who personally shepherded the creation and commercialization of this technology in an existing business. Today, Sperry Sun is almost a $2 billion business within Halliburton. After Sperry Sun, I worked at Baker Hughes as a uh, national operations manager and then moved on to my next creative destruction environment, which was Landmark Graphics, which was at the other end of the spectrum, which is go out there and dislocate markets, change markets from the outside in a new business, where I was the vice president of marketing out there. And Landmark was a startup that created a new paradigm in visualization-based 3D seismic interpretation. <coughs> Like Sperry Sun, Landmark is also part of Halliburton today, almost a, a billion dollar division within the company. After Landmark, I started CETA Resources, which is my consulting firm. And again, here too, I'm focused on creative destruction, uh, but most of my business is really in existing businesses. And I've helped since 1994, over 50 businesses in the oil and gas, engineering, manufacturing, software technology, and services industries. And amongst all my clients, and the reason I'm mentioning all these companies is because I'm going to use this as examples later. Uh, Rich Neufer, uh, who, uh, who's at Harsco, is a, is a great example of creative uh, destruction within companies. And he just happens to be an excellent uh, serial entrepreneur, if you will, in the sense he does this division after division after division within Harsco. Finally, I was fortunate enough. Of course, I did Point Cross on the side, which was another two years of my life in a startup with Suresh Madhavan. Uh, but I was fortunate that I went to one of the best engineering schools in the world, IIT. And I'll say Bombay slightly because I have IIT colleagues from other campuses with me here. 
Uh, but I did go to IIT Bombay. And the interesting thing was that my peers and contemporaries there that I could observe as students, and it's important for this audience that I knew these people when they were students, very much in their learning mode. So to name a few, uh, names like uh, Nanda Nilekani, CEO of Infosys, uh, Bharat Desai, CEO of Sintel, both these companies are publicly traded companies. Then you have uh, Ramesh Vangal, who took Pepsi to India. He's a president, CEO of Catra, Subra Iyer. Have you heard of Sub uh, Webex? Has got sold. Another CEO, uh, Himan Kanake, who told, uh, sold his company, Torrent Technologies, to Ericsson. Rakesh Mathur, who is the first IITN on the cover of Business Week back in 1998 sold his company to Amazon, which put his business out of, I mean, took his technology out of business. And then you have other people that I've watched. These world-class market anarchists, as I call them, have thrived in global markets and have created several billion dollars of value, interestingly enough, in a multicultural world. These entrepreneurial leaders had successes in a very different world than that of their birth. Universally, I mean, coming to leadership, universally, leadership is the ability of an individual to realize vision through an organization. Leaders across the world have a common characteristic. They convert vision to reality by influencing, motivating, empowering, enabling. You can think of as many adverbs and verbs as you'd like, but really, they, they realize their vision through others who contribute towards the success of their organization. Similarly, leaders have certain common characteristics and competencies that you've all heard of. Many of them have been talked about in previous sessions, but today my focus is specific to entrepreneurial leadership competencies, especially those that I've seen uh, in, in leaders across the globe. Entrepreneurship on the other side, on, on the other hand, is about dislocating markets and getting financial benefits out of it. I use the term dislocation to describe our entrepreneurship rather than the mild term or a popular term disruption because entrepreneurship is more than just creating a disturbance or a commotion. Real entrepreneurs dislodge, displace, and dislocate. If leaders are visionaries, entrepreneurial leaders are passionate visionaries who see financial opportunities in altering and changing markets. They are builders, achievers, fiercely independent, trust me, persistent and passionate. Entrepreneurial leaders are leaders on steroids. You've got to meet these people and you've got to experience them. And especially when you've experienced them from the childhood, these things are common characteristics. They realize the vision through a very simple concept. And I, being a metallurgical engineer, I'm going to use the acronym OR, O-R-E. What does it stand for? Opportunity, risk, and execution. To make it very simple, they realize the vision through O-R-E. Opportunity, recognizing opportunity, realizing opportunity, gauging risk, and execution effectiveness. However, to accomplish these, there are, there are a lot of competencies that you need. And rather than looking at competencies required for O, R, and E, I've got a list of eight of them that I'm going to talk about. And I'll mention them to you several times. So I, you know, I hope you remember them. The first one that I have, which is a very sim a simple characteristic, is they, are, they have the greatest degree of self-awareness. They have a great sense of self-awareness. The second one, a competency that almost all entrepreneurs have, is that they have great, strong synthesizing skills. The third one is that they have a laser-sharp focus on customers and markets. Fourth, they are master marketers. Number five, at the core of everything that they do, effective execution is their creed. I mean, at the end of the day, without execution, nothing matters. And they forge respectful re relationships with ethics and integrity. And of course, they have their eyes firmly on the financial aspects of the business. 
and just from a protective standpoint on the legal end of the business. So first, if now I'll get into some of the details of this. When I talk about self-awareness, their self-knowledge of what they know and what they don't know, what their strengths are and what are their weaknesses and what are the things that they need to shore up, that self-knowledge is absolutely phenomenal in these entrepreneurs. Yes, there may be a little bit of ego here and there, but that ego may show up when they're dealing with others, but in their own private space, and often I've seen that, their sense of what they are is just phenomenal. What they are not is equally important to them. So what happens is entrepreneurs essentially become lifelong learners, trying to shore up their weaknesses so that they have absolutely, they try to attain perfection. An entrepreneurial leader is a constant leader, learning from every source and situation. They're also strong synthesizers. What do I mean by strong synthesizers? They can go across multiple disciplines and arrive at conclusive insights very quickly. I've seen this happen over and over again, and I don't know how they do it. They have a strong suit in one discipline but have broad interests and have the ability to draw knowledge and wisdom wisdom from a range of different disciplines. And they could go from economics, politics, finance, philosophy, fiction, cinema, music, I mean, history. Hist they're all pretty big history buffs. All my entrepreneurial co uh, contemporaries, whether they were from IIT, especially Nanda Nilekani, Bob Brooker from NL Industries, John Mouton from uh, Landmark, Rich Neufer, are probably some of the most well-informed people in the world. It's not that they know, the, the, the concept that is commonly used and I hear about is this concept about being a fox versus a hedgehog. Entrepreneur leaders are rarely hedgehogs. They're all foxes and they are extremely broad in their knowledge base. That's the reason why Nandan shows up on the first page of The World is Flat. It's not because that he's the CEO of Infosys. It is how he has synthesized the rest of the world and conveyed in very succinct language to Tom Friedman that technology is going to create a level playing field, which of course got translated into The World is Flat. But this synthesizing capability is something that you need to absolutely have to understand market opportunities, because you do need to get out of the box to see new opportunities, to gauge risks, because you can be, as an entrepreneur, you can be very optimistic, so you've got to firmly keep your head in the right place in terms of gauging risk, and then turn aspirations into action. Again, there's O-R-E, aspirations into action. You need a very strong <laughs> synthesizing capability. The third element that comes up, and I've seen this constantly, entrepreneurial leaders have very strong focus on customers and markets. They really don't care about competition, but they do care about competition in the sense of how they're going to react to what they do. But competition rarely defines their course of action. It is customers and markets that define an entrepreneurial leader's actions. They are curious, constantly seeking to better understand their markets and their customers, especially when they have to figure out the market dynamics through what I call the, as the four C's, customers, climate, competition, and your own company. Most entrepreneurs learn, understand the texture of their markets about the four C's, risk and execution, on someone else's penny. You need to recognize this. They work at different firms in the industry and then embark on their own. None of these people I've mentioned today have actually started a, a business right out of college. I mean, the examples like Google are very rare. Most entrepreneurs have actually started somewhere. Landmark Graphics is one of the most successful uh, startups in the oil and gas industry in recent times. And every one of their founders, John Mouton, Royce Nelson, Andy Hildebrand, Bob Limbaugh, had decades of experience in the industry before they launched Landmark and went out to uh, Seven Rosen uh, for their funding. So an exception to this rule, though, was Bob Brooker, who came to NL 
from Cummins Engine Company. He was not even from the industry. But, uh, but he was a brilliant brain. He was a quick study who could analyze, synthesize, visualize, strategize, and execute with the best in the world. The key thing was no detail was too minute for this man, and he quickly constructed a market, a competitive, strategic, and a service delivery framework that was the foundation for a multi-billion dollar enterprise today. And this, I'm telling you, this has happened in less than 20 years, 20, 22 years. The original NL Industries, interestingly enough, NL stood for National Lead. And in the 70s, they went about buying oil, just like the booms of today, and GE wanting to get into the oil and gas industry now. Very similarly, NL bought a bunch of companies in the oil and gas industry, Bayroid, McCullough. And when this new technology was developed, Broker actually went and bought Sperry Sun, saying that we need this kind of a company to deploy this new technology. The technology that we bought uh, that came with Sperry Sun today, that uh, it was a $100 million company, is 0% of Sperry Sun. 100% of his business is the new technology that was developed within uh, uh, the NL Industries. That whole concept was, was Brooker, but he came from outside the industry. He was a terrific teacher, and I learned a lot from him, especially about creative destruction of existing markets. You need to be an anarchist, by the way, if you, you've got to uh, think like one. Independent startups have opposing forces only on the outside. Landmark, when it dealt with the marketplace, that's all everybody was focused on. But when I was at NL, the, the resistors were both outside the company and inside the company. And it took a special talent like Brooker, his stamina and fortitude, to overcome these additional internal forces of resistance. Another competency uh, that, is, that is needed is being a, a good marketer. I'm not asking every entrepreneurial leader to be a Steve Jobs. That's almost impossible. There's only one of him in the world but it helps to aspire to be one. Now, why is it important to be a marketer? Because the first step in creative destruction is to reach out and own the minds of your customers, your targeted customers. First get mind share, market share will follow. Let me assure you that. In, in no situation has market share ever been greater than mind share. Every day, every waking moment, okay, you are bombarded with information. Messages that create clutter in your mind and being a marketer gives an entrepreneurial venture a competitive edge that speeds market acceptance and penetration. Very important. If you want to accelerate your revenue, you better be a good marketer. Otherwise, you can go along with the flow. Which brings me to the next very important issue and that is an effective action orientation. Much is said and written about decision making. You know, everybody talks about decision making, but we get results by taking action. Okay, the military, when it deals with its enemy, has a, a concept that they implement. It's called UDA, an UDA loop. It was developed by a Colonel Boyd, and it, it's pretty prevalent. If you look up, if you Google O O D A, you'll get a lot of literature on it. It stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. It's a loop. Okay, successful art entrepreneurs essentially use the observe, orient, decide, act concept to, to accomplish an objective. They are experts at having a blueprint, but they, are, they stay flexible and adaptable on how they accomplish their goals. They are not fixed in the way they do things. Successful entrepreneurial leaders have rapid UDA cycles, and their organizations have people who can deal with ambiguity. There's nothing certain about the way in the direction things are going to move. It's almost like a guerrilla or a commando unit as opposed to a very well-organized army or a military. Entrepreneurial firms have an organizational structure and command system that the Germans call oft trog taktik a mission-oriented one where a directive is followed in its spirit, not letter, where greater leeway is given to the staff to execute and affect changes in customer and market behavior. They quickly learn from actions, set new objectives, a new UDA loop to reach their overall goal. So you've got a very flexible, effective organizational structure.
to execute. Then comes the next important factor, and that is respectful relationships with other people. An entrepreneurial leader is a team builder and a motivator with excellent communication skills, just like any, any other leader. But at the core of this competency is a strong sense of ethics and integrity that becomes self-evident in every interaction. I use the term ethics in a broad sense than just a personal or a business ethical sense meeting the word of law. That is not what I mean. Great entrepreneurial leaders understand that they carry, gr carry greater societal responsibilities. They inculcate and instill their ethical stamp on their organization and attract like-minded employees who fuse into a powerful, motivated workforce. At the end of the day, it boils down to created, creating trusted relationships within organizations and outside with customers and suppliers. Finally, an entrepreneurial leader recognizes that the firm's financial and other stakeholders have to be satisfied. The stronger ones have in an innate, intuitive financial and legal focus. Money does make the world go round, okay? And during the early days of growth of a venture, they have an eagle eye on cash flow and are resourceful and creative in managing their money. You gotta understand, entrepreneurial firms are like little boats in very tumultuous waters. It's like being in a hurricane. And cash is like having ballast so that you don't capsize. And when you are an entrepreneurial one, especially a successful one, you're very susceptible to attacks by your competition, especially larger companies. The successful ones make sure that they, their intellectual capital and other assets are also protected legally from the predators. So a leader in an entrepreneurial environment needs competencies to judge opportunities, gauge risks, and execute effectively. And the eight competencies, if I may, are self-awareness, strong synthesizing skills, focus on customers, master marketer, effective action orientation, respectful relationships, ethics and integrity, and financial and legal focus. So far, I've talked about characteristics that are quite easily understood and comprehensible in a homogeneous world. But when you talk with any venture capitalist today, you'll realize that almost all firms being funded have some international component to them. Every technology firm has a China or an India or an East European or a Latin component to them. So how does an emerging multicultural world affect these leadership uh, competencies. In an open global economy where borders are porous, an entrepreneur will find that opportunities, risk, and execution can be substantially altered by these global forces. Entrepreneurial leadership in a multicultural world consequently requires an expanded version of these eight competencies, but actually, if you focus on two of them, the other six somehow get affected too. And these two are, the first one and the top of the list is respectful relationship. It's absolutely at the top of the list. I grew up in India and growing up in India gave my friends, all my entrepreneurial friends out here as well as not in this room, gave us an edge in this multicultural heterogeneous world. Indians may appear to everyone else as being a, a very homogeneous mass of people but in reality, India is the world's oldest melting pot, if I may, where the population can be, can be classified and broken down by language, religion, caste, class, and sex, of course. And then you have traditional conservatives, traditional people to liberals, and all kinds of shades in between. Just imagine the permutations and combinations, if you will. 18 major languages, when I last counted, thousands of dialects, all major religions of the world, four major castes and substantial number of subsects, multiple economic classes, and of course, two sexes. Because of these divisions, ironically, every Indian actually belongs to a minority group. From the day an Indian is born, she has to learn to assimilate, thrive, and succeed in this environment. We learn very early in our lives 
to celebrate differences rather than just being tolerant or, under, or understanding others. The core of the celebration of differences is respect for the other person and their beliefs. It also helped that my friends and I had idealistic parents who had participated in India's freedom movement and were greatly influenced by Mahatma Gandhi and principles of living in global harmony. So when we came to the United States and onto the global stage, it was just another extension of being able to assimilate and succeed in a very different world. We immersed ourselves into the local society, learned to live in it and contribute to it. Sure, people are suspicious when meeting people who are different and we did face resistance because we were different, but we quickly learned that the value that we brought to the business table erased that difference. There was no systemic prejudice or bigotry. When I first joined the oil industry, uh, in, in, this was very early 80s, actually 1981, on my first trip to Lafayette, Louisiana, my firm salesman looked at me as if I was from another planet. I mean, I had just been built probably, you know, they were exposed to very little before that. They wondered how this Indian bimba, they called me a bimba, bright young MBA. <laughs> they, they wondered how this Indian bimba is going to help them. And we were in a recession, so how was, how was I going to help them save their jobs? And if, and if I saved their jobs, how was I going to increase their commissions? I met resistance at every step. They would not share customer information, they would not take me to their customers, but they were very polite and hospitable. And of course, they treated me courteously, graciously, which included feeding me Cajun food. When they saw that I really relished their spicy food, they opened up a little bit. And then when I showed genuine interest in their Zydeco music and began attending some of these, and Richard knows about my interest in music, any kind, and uh, they really opened up. I knew that I had won them over when I began receiving FedEx packages from Louisiana. They contained fuming cayenne peppers. My, my, my field crews, you know, these are MWD crews and mud logging crews that were out there. Where, whenever these people went to uh, uh, pro provide services in fields where there were cayenne peppers growing, they'd pluck them and send them to me. Even to this day, I remember Anna, our, our secretary, walking towards me with this FedEx package, her arms absolutely stretched out as if she was carrying nuclear toxic waste. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you could, you, you could smell it uh, through the FedEx package. But that, wasn't, that was just an indicator, that was just a symptom. But the reality of it was, I did help them make a lot of money. Because I changed the pricing, I made it easier for them to sell uh, into their customer environment. And actually, we built a technology out of Lafayette and, and, uh, and grew it, but that was, the first barrier that you broke, and it was really through uh, the, the whole idea of creating respectful relationships across multiple cultures, and you do that through immersion in the culture. So you, you can't do it by just sitting outside. However, even before you get into that, um, leaders in a multicultural world also have to become super synthesizers of society. So even if you don't have the ability to go in and live in, in these places, uh, you really have to understand uh, societies now. And there are minimum four dimensions to consider when you need to uh, become this super synthesizers. And the first one is the macro dimension. When I come, I come to Rice quite often in the business school, and some of you may have attended my uh, a lecture or two about understanding India and Indians, I talk about, I have only one slide, except that it's got about 100 boxes on it. Uh, but there are only four dimensions to them. The first one is the macro dimension, which looks at cultural, religious, scientific, political, architectural, the economic histories of the people, which is a macro view of, when, you, when you're looking at a different culture, you've got to look at it from a macro perspective. Uh, and not from your own perspective. When you're dealing with an India or a China or other cultures, uh, we're talking about thousands of years of culture. I mean, 200, 300 years is like, well, <laughs> doesn't mean much. So, in any case, but you've got to look at it from that perspective 
because those things do have a tendency to affect individuals at the micro level, which is the second part. You have to look at the micro dimension to look at what are the drivers and the motivations of individuals. And unless you have a picture of the macro and the micro, you, and of course, that has to be uh, mitigated with resources that are available in a, in a particular society and institutions that operate. For example, again, you know, what are the resources available uh, in, in being able to synthesize opportunities. For, and we do see very often when people talk about India, uh, the, the, they always talk about uh, resources either being there or not there. And uh, whether the resource is there or not, uh, the, the knowledge resource is an arbitrage player right now, but there are immense opportunities out there in infrastructure plays. So uh, depending on how you look at it, and then you also have to consider institutions that are uh, be able to assimilate and synthesize the concept of institutions. Uh, well, and when I talk about institutions, I'm talking about the legal system, the political system, uh, economic, and others that are important to uh, business activities. All this may seem to, I'm, I'm, I'm thrusting a lot of in you. I mean, uh, but then the world is on that path to economic homogeneity but there is a substantial amount of heterogeneity still in existence. So you guys happen to be in that crux or the crossroads where on one hand, uh, you have to deal with uh, uh, entrepreneurial situations equipped with uh, learnings out of a homogeneous world, but getting ready to embark in a multicultural world which requires that you uh, uh, learn different cultures, develop respectful relationships, and become super synthesizers so that you'd understand uh, a market, a country, a society, and its people as fast as you can. Just for, for, for forcing yourself on forging these relationships, as well as understanding uh, societies and becoming super synthesizers, adds unique facets uh, which will affect your other six uh, competencies. I, I cannot predict what they would be, but these two I know are, be, are the most important. So to summarize, successful entrepreneurial leaders realize their vision by focusing on excellence in, opera, uh, in uh, recognizing opportunities, gauging risk, and effective execution. And to be effective in this ORE, a leader in entrepreneurial environment needs these eight competencies that I talked about, and to be successful in a multicultural world, they build first on their super synthesizers and establishing respectful relationships and use these to expand their other competencies. I hope you found my perspectives useful and I hope they help you in your efforts in creative destruction. And I thank you all for the opportunity to talk with you, present to you and share with you my thoughts. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to. Sadeep? Yes. That was very good. Thank you. You talked about the four C's. Yeah. Could you go over them, please? The four C's are customers, competition, your business climate, and your own company. And when you, when you talk about customers, usually uh, uh, creative destruction really starts with the customer. A customer is doing things in a particular way right now, and you want to be able to alter the current way of doing business. And that's where entrepreneurs play a significant role. <coughs> you need to understand from customers the who, what, where, when, and why, and how they buy from you and from your competition. The questions are who, who's your customer, and I can, I can tell you from experience, when you ask the question, who's your customer, it can take me half a day to get the right answer. Uh, who, what, where, when, and why, and how customers buy from you and your competition will give you insights like you wouldn't believe and actually give you nuggets uh, for that mother load that will allow you to change that market. Uh, I think you know, the talk is very interesting. One thing I'm a little bit puzzled about you know, how we make a distinction between 
the characteristics of general leadership and uh, entrepreneurial uh, types of leader. One example, you know, let me focus on the characteristic you mentioned, uh, we call customer or oriented. Mm -hmm. I think it's important for any leaders to be customer oriented, but it seems you know, in technology industry in particular, you <coughs> you probably need to you know, make a balance between technology and customer. A long time ago, Henry Ford has a, you know, said something like this. He said, if I listen to customers, I probably will offer them a faster horse rather than you know, develop a new car. Correct. So it seemed to me, you know, particularly for the entrepreneurial leader, if you want to be creative disrupt, destruction, they, you know, they probably need to focus more on the technology side or rather than the market side. Uh, how do you think about this? Okay. This would, are, you, are you a technologist? I need to understand your perspective because well, I teach, I teach uh, technology innovation in the June school. Okay, uh, it's a, it's important to understand that. Uh, the the answer is yes to all those questions. Okay, uh, because I, in in a lot of situations, I'm not doing flippant out here. In a lot of situations, you do need to recognize you do expect any leader to be market and customer oriented. The reality of the situation, okay. And this is something that I preach all the time. The reality of the situation is most leaders, at least people who are supposed to be leaders at helms of companies, usually are custodians of their business. They're not addicted to growth. Okay? They're like, you know, you know what the term I use, and I use it with my clients too. They're like trust fund kids. They have been endowed, they've been given this corporation. And therefore, they want to just make it grow at the rate at which the winds of the market take it and change it. That's what current leadership is in modern America, in the Western world. And that's one of the reasons why your MBA course needs to recognize that this is not going to last for too long. Because in a multicultural world, when these borders are porous, External forces are going to come in and change the rules. So the first assumption that you make, that leaders are customer focused, I would agree that they should be prescriptive, but the descriptive part of it is most of them are not. I can take a lot of leaders into a customer's office and they'll fail miserably in even understanding what is it that the customer wants. How many of you are in situations that, uh, and, um, and entrepreneurial leaders, where, where the separation comes in, it is the entrepreneurial leader who is your first marketer and the first salesman of the company. Okay? It is not, it is not uh, delegated to somebody else within the company. Would you agree? Agree. I mean, I've got three entrepreneurial leaders out here. <laughs> I'm serious. These, these are some of the most successful entrepreneurial uh, uh, luminaries in Houston. And the, the, they are the ones who lead it. It is not... A, uh, the leadership at a corporation. That's number one. The second part of it is the, the issue that you brought up, and that was the issue of you know, this concept of disruptive technologies, right? Disruptive technologies, when you're talking about them, the, if you are very close to the customer, all they're expecting from you are enha enhancements. They do not expect you to break away and tell me that I need something which is very different from the current way of doing business. I agree with you, but entrepreneurial leaders recognize the difference of being in the, in the business of disrupting markets as opposed to being in the business of, that's why I said, uh, the regular leaders will be close to customers and will do the enhancement part of it. But when I'm talking about entrepreneurial leaders, they're the ones breaking away from the pack and doing things that dislocate the market, which means they're not doing the enhancement, they're doing something different that actually changes market dynamics. I defined that right in the beginning. That's, recognize that that's the big difference. And the way they do it, and, and uh, uh, if, you, if you read the Disruptive Technologies paper, not the book, the, the paper, he also talks about the same thing. And what we did at NL was actually a very disruptive technology uh, in the sense that when I have my colleagues from Schlumberger and Baker Hughes here, 
Uh, Schlumberger was in the wireline business, and we went and did something which was that replaced wireline logging. And we actually licensed the technology from Schlumberger, who said that this was a useless technology. So we do fun things when you're an entrepreneurial company. <laughs> you go to your competition, license the technology that they say doesn't work, make it work, and of course, we are very polite and we are under the radar. And then Schlumberger realizes that we are in the business. I have a copy of that email, some, not email, a memo, uh, somewhere uh, four years later or three years later. Of course, you're always under the radar. Remember this. Uh, three years later, we got an, uh, I saw a copy of this thing. Um, it said that I lost market share. And Schlumberger is very good at uh, watching every foot of well that is drilled and how much had wire line on it, their wire line on it. And uh, that memo came along which said that we lost 13% of share to Sperry Sun. And you know what? We were right across the street from them. And they did not know what we did. Right across the street. And that street had two lanes, one to go, one to come. It's called Industrial Boulevard in Sugarland. So there are a lot of things that, when you are in an entrepreneurial environment, you do not, you absolutely do not poke the giant in the eye. That is part of our strategy. Come to on. extend his idea, uh, Henry Ford realized that his customer was not in the horse business, Correct. but in the transportation business. So he just offered a faster horse, which is a car. Yep. That, that, and uh, Ted Levitt talks, I mean, if you want to read uh, about uh, this very concept, a real guru who wrote about this was Ted Levitt. Uh, and his seminal paper was called <coughs> My Marketing Myopia. The reason the railways went literally out of business was because they thought they were in the railway business, not in the transportation business. Similarly, every mode of transportation. So uh, the point is well taken, by the way. Extremely well taken. And I love this whole concept of uh, technology and innovation and how do you uh, commercialize and uh, successfully and speedily new technologies. I love that. I uh, love that space. I agree with you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what advice will you give somebody who has an idea and thinking of developing and hopefully implementing this idea uh, into a commercial venture? What I advise? The first point I would say is uh, uh, vet the idea with people who know the domain. The, and and I, the question I always have is, how much experience do you have in that space? Do you have any experience in that space? Uh, very often, we'll, you know, in the, during the dot-com era, people, money was available, and any kind of crazy idea uh, uh, got paid. And there's a lot of money that got wasted. But in the current environment, what they look for is expertise of the management team. So you need to really understand, move from what, what is the conceptual phase to really have an understanding of what are the market dynamics and understanding of customers' competition, okay? And what are the other forces that will allow this uh, technology uh, to be lifted outside of just taking on uh, additional comp competition, I mean, uh, existing competition. For example, I'll, I'll, the, the example I'm going to use is even though I joined the, the oil industry during literally the, I mean, the price of oil in, peaked in 1981 in the month of September. I joined the oil industry in September of 1981. And 1982, the price of oil dropped from $34 a barrel to, I think, 24 And 1986, dropped to 8 bucks a barrel. Okay? And this is, I mean, you know, riding a, a Bronco or one of these mechanical bulls is nothing compared to what we went through. But I was very fortunate. I was very lucky that I picked an area where they were people are looking for cheaper and faster and better ways of producing oil and gas. And I just happened to be in the two most significant businesses, two most significant technologies that actually helped that, MWD and uh, 3D Seismic. And I learned an incredible amount from it. But the key thing that comes out of it for these kinds of uh, get out of the concept phase. And the, the, the win that actually was in our sale on both these things 
was the fact that the price of oil was low and people needed faster, better, cheaper ways of finding oil and gas. And they were ready to look at new technologies because the old technologies just couldn't cut it. In the oil industry, do not try to sell new technologies and the price of oil is 80 bucks, 60 bucks. You'll die. But they don't have time for you because those winds are so much into their sales and everybody thinks, uh, you know, the best thing since sliced bread. You know, I mean, it's the same thing during the dot-com era, or for that matter, the tech boom. We all thought we were geniuses in the stock market, right? 80%, a very astute uh, CFO of, uh, of a company, actually a client, Joe Compofelis, who was, was at several companies, said that 80% of the success of any CEO is because of market conditions. Only 20% or even less than that is strategy, and he has to be darn good at it. The rest of it is just market conditions. That's why I say most leaders are custodians. A janitor could do a better job. <laughs> I'm serious. Yes. You've got to meet these guys and look at their businesses and things they do. Go into these companies, smell them, <laughs> smell the coffee. <laughs> I'm serious. Entrepreneurial Entrepreneurs make more difference and create more value in any economy than existing businesses. Existing businesses, usually, uh, you know, a, a majority of them can be toppled very easily. Very, very easy. They are on very thin stilts. And all you have to know is which point to fracture them. Yes, so the, um, the questioner doesn't get too frank away be when people are in that, <coughs> with the full wind in their sails, is when a lot of the technology gets developed, it does, I mean, the ideas come out, but they get set on, set aside. Yeah, they do. Just be prepared that it is going to probably be on a down cycle when the opportunity to you got to be pre prepared for it. And, and the thing about when it is, there was a lot of wind in the sales is that the market myopia is also very dominant. And so they're setting themselves up to get speared by the uh, competition. That, that competition. So, I mean, from by outsiders, so you don't necessarily have to be an instant. <coughs> mm -hmm. But be prepared for a hard fight if you try to launch it into the... Into, I mean, it's against, uh, against market... Conditions. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, this, uh, I know Nandan pretty well, so I share, he shares a lot of information with me. And he presented this, by the way, uh, when we had one of these IIT alumni things in Houston. He said the re Infosys was founded probably in 1980 or 81, somewhere about there. And he graduated in 78. He worked for Putney for three years, and then he and Narayan Murthy moved out and started Infosys. He said, the, and I've known Nandan for a long time, and I've seen him in Houston and in other parts of the country. He had an AMC Pacer. I don't know how many of you even can imagine that silly car. It looked like a car had been hacked in half. Uh, and his entire worldly possessions were in the trunk of that car. It was a hatchback. And very often they got stolen uh, the, because it was visible. And then he used to go around the country providing services computing services, and he never flew from one place to another. He drove that car everywhere, and we used to meet often enough, and slowly built that business, slowly built that business. But what he shared with us was that in 1991, when India went broke, okay, the reason they could not expand and play the arbitrage, labor arbitrage game, was because computers, the thing that they needed to grow their business, were actually being taxed. I mean, they, they were import duties on them. They were substantial. In 1991, when India went broke and World Bank said, you got to get rid of all these tariffs, they removed tariffs on computers. That's when the, the business started growing. But he said the real growth started coming in because of Y2K. They needed people. They needed programmers. They needed resources. Y2K came along, and just after Y2K, when the demand started going away, the technology bust. He says when technology bust came along, everybody needed low-cost uh, resources. Again, that's how it. so. The, he says a lot of the, a lot of being in the entrepreneurial end of the business 
is to be prepared for these changes that come along. Anytime situation changes, that's why there are, there are only four ways. <laughs> this is amazing, you know, after being in this business for 30 odd years, you find that there are only four ways you can increase actually your revenues. And I've been trying to find the fifth way, and I'm sure there is, but I haven't found it. There are only four ways to increase it. Number one is to increase your pricing, right? By the way, for those of you who haven't seen this article on the front page of Wall Street Journal, this is something I preach. The easiest thing to do is actually increase your pricing. But most companies are scared to raise prices. They think they're going to affect the marketplace and share and all that. But anyway, see the article on the front page of Wall Street Journal if you want to know what to do with pricing. The second thing that you can do, which is this one, in, in ease of execution, pricing first, <coughs> market share is second. Okay? Increasing market share, which is not only organic growth, but also acquisitions. The third component is taking advantage of business climate, wins. That is, if, you, if you're right in the middle of this rush, and this is where Infosys has, and in, Indian companies have been very good, is taking advantage of all these forces and then multiplying and using it, and then a attaching the other two components to it. And the fourth component by which you can increase your revenues is by new products. That's the most difficult thing to do. So when you're talking about innovation, new technologies, it's the riskiest thing for any company to do. But the interesting thing is most companies do not do number one, two, three, or four. They just go along. A rising tide raises all boats. And so if you're an entrepreneur, the hardest thing to, for you to do is to sit back and watch these opportunities go past you. Yes, sir. You talked about the importance of immersing yourself in the society. And, but for us from a different background, is there any advantage of coming from a different background? And if there's one, how do we use that? The, the immersion part of it needs to happen with an open mind. The first thing is really the open mind, the ability to do that. Uh, I don't know the extent to which, uh, I don't know whether which firm this is, Cisco? I think it's Cisco. 20% <coughs> of all the CEOs' direct reports now have to live in India. Okay, it's a corporate mandate now that senior leadership, 20, I think it's Cisco, okay, have to live in India. Accenture has 35,000 employees in, in India. It's the largest outsourcing company in India. Did you know that? They add every year the equivalent of an Infosys in India. What do you think is going to happen? The reality of the situation in terms of immersion for larger companies is different from for entrepreneurial environments. But to really get those leadership characteristics, it doesn't matter which uh, society you go and immerse yourself in, <coughs> but it has to be something very different from yours and recognize some of the elements that are actually very surprising. Have you lived in any other place except the United States? I, where, where are you? I'm from China. You're from China. Um, uh, I knew you were from Far East somewhere. But mm -hmm. You're from China, mm -hmm. and you're living in the United States. Now, those are two very different, uh, different societies. Right now, what you're going through is an immersion in the American culture. That to Texas students. Okay, at Rice University. But once you start working and you get a global, start beginning to get into a global perspective, the other way of immersion is start working in a corporate environment which allows you this ability to touch uh, multiple cultures. So that immersion starts in multiple layers. Once you get into the workforce, that is probably one of the best uh, immersions that you would have. I'll give you an example of uh, a friend, uh, Hemant Kanakia. Hemant Kanakia is the most unlikely entrepreneur that I've ever met. He graduated with all of us in 75, then went on a hiking trip for, I don't know where he went, came back and suddenly takes up a job with Tata Consulting Services, uh, two levels higher than all his classmates. Uh, he does that for a couple of years, and the next thing I hear is that uh, he's back in He's worked at TCS, which is kind of the granddaddy of all the Indian outsourcing companies. That's 
That's the oldest. And everybody has kind of come out of that in one form or another. Uh, and then he, the next thing I hear, he's at Stanford doing his PhD. Okay? Nothing wrong with it. He's a very bright guy, don't get me wrong. Uh, and this was 1980. Uh, where is Kanakya? He is at Stanford doing his PhD. 1988, he's still doing PhD at Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere about that time frame, I hear that, you know, okay, he, I mean, he comes in. I mean, he comes to Houston often enough. And he comes in and says, I'm now going to go to work for AT&T, Bell Labs. Goes to Bell Labs, works there for probably four or five years. And the next thing he does is, oh, well, I've started my own company, Torrent Technologies. And he said, okay, so what? I have no clue what he does. Uh, but something in telecom. And uh, somewhere about 1998, 97, 98, 99 time frame, there's a little email that comes around saying, Kanaka sold his company to Ericsson for $400 million. Okay? Now, the kind of, I mean, be, be, you've got to understand this guy. I mean, first of all, Kanaka is probably, even though Nandan is the luminary top star in terms of people knowing who he is because he's the CEO of Infosys, Kanaki, on the other hand, is equally capable, except he really doesn't care. Okay? His immersion actually comes in social issues. Okay? He actually goes out there and does things for... Uh, he's, he sets up fellowships for students, poorer students, educational institutions. He's very socially conscious. So what he was doing in those years that he disappeared was actually doing things in villages in India. And uh, on, on, so, so his immersion was a different one, okay? And then he got into the corporate world, but he picked the best place to go to. He went to the best universities. He worked at the best uh, uh, technology innovation company, Bell Labs at that time. And, and then he started his own, and now I think he's a venture capitalist. But the immersion that needs to take place really depends on uh, what aspect are you trying to immerse yourself in. Is this an immersion related to technology development? Or do you need an immersion in trying to understand markets? What aspect? This is where the self-knowledge and self-awareness needs to come in. You know what I'm saying? What, what, where do you think is your gap? Is what you need to immerse in. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, that, the, the, the self-knowledge that these people have is just phenomenal. Uh, Bharat Desai was another, another one of my classmates. Uh, and his, his thing was very simple. And uh, the interesting thing, his immersion was, he was born in Kenya, grew up in Kenya, and then there was this East African uh, uh, independence and all that, and he got caught in all that. Turmoil. I always thought it was Uganda because Idi Amin can explain. But Kenya had a very similar thing too. And so he got, his whole family literally had to leave uh, uh, Africa in a, uh, impoverished. And when they came to India, and this guy joins uh, IIT, and they did, I mean, they, they pretty good family. And then joins Tata Boros, which is kind of a sister company to TCS comes to the United States, to Detroit. I think they had some contracts. Burroughs was based in Detroit. And then started Sintel, $2,000. Today, the market capitalization is over a billion. And he probably owns about 70, 90% of it. His immersion was very, very focused on how do I get money? I don't want to see those kinds of lives ever again. And he always felt that he had missed out a lot because of all those turmoil and transitions. Uh, that he went through. And uh, that's why I always have a soft corner for uh, whatever he, uh, he's done very well. And the other part of it is that he created an American company. Sintel was an American company. It was based in Troy, Michigan. It was an American company. While the winds of change helped Infosys because they had an India advantage, Bharat was caught, Sintel was caught with a completely different paradigm in that his entire workforce was American. It was an American workforce. So he had to actually reinvent the entire company uh, with the, playing the Indian uh, arbitrage game. 
understand. So he really had to go back and immerse himself in India. And now the entire company has become a very Indian company, even though originally it was an American one. Decision making has all moved to India with service delivery. The market conditions are such that he literally had to go live there to figure this, these things out. And he does still live there. It depends. If you had to immerse yourself in something, in understanding whatever is your area of weakness, that's, that's very important. Thank you. What a way to end our lecture series. Thank you for your wonderful talk and sharing your experiences with us, Mr. Pradipanand. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we are very happy to initiate and have this leadership competency forum as the co-sponsors Baker Institute, Rice International Student Association, Leadership Rice, Graduate Student Association, and Office of International Student Scholars. And we will have different forums or a continuation of this forum for the fall semester. Please keep in touch with our group, and then we can send emails to you. We will have box dinners outside, which are provided by a Turkish restaurant, DNR, on Montrose. Please help yourself. Thank you. Have a good evening.